He needs little introduction as he appeared in the latest IKEA advertisement here in the Netherlands. <coughs> Over the last decades, he has climbed the company ladder, being head of design of IKEA at the moment, Marcus Engman. From the start, it has been his ambition to give designers a bigger emphasis in the company's product range by inviting renowned designers, such as fashion designer Walter van Bierendonk or designer Piet Hein Eek, Ilse Crawford, and more recently Pinar and Viola, to work with them also in multiple and variable contexts. I'm sure Marcus will tell us more about that. Merging his personal curiosity with his professional mission, we already heard it with Kuno around the question how to make life better for every day, for every body. Hinting on the principle of democratic design, again, high quality for a large amount of people. Ladies and gentlemen, our last guest of tonight, all the way from Sweden, Marcus Engman, join me. Thank you. So, pleasure to be here, guys. Now I'm the only thing that is between now and the cocktail party. <laughs> so bear with me for those boring moments. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I'm here to talk about democratic design. That's how we do things at IKEA. And first of all, maybe it's good to understand how we work at IKEA before going into the design process. So, you know what? We have an upbringing. We come from a place small and dark in the middle of nowhere, in the southern parts of Sweden. That's where IKEA started. It was actually the most poor part of Sweden also. And uh, it's 10,000 inhabitants in this lovely place called Elmult. 2,000 of those people are working with uh, democratic design in our democratic design center, doing product development for IKEA. So, coming from a very small place, in the middle of nowhere, sharing some facts and figures with you. That's a pretty large figure, isn't it? Almost four billion. That's the amount of things that we produce and sell every year to make a better everyday life for people around the world. Four billion <coughs> things. That's quite a lot. That's also a big responsibility, isn't it? It's not just a big figure. So how do we do it? <coughs> Thousand. It's a little bit smaller figure. This is the amount of suppliers that works for IKEA. So doing four billion things, it's only thousand suppliers around the world that does this. And the majority of suppliers are actually from Europe, still. Why do we have it in that way? It's because it's hard, you know. If you want to change stuff, you have to learn each other, each other's <coughs> ways. You have to earn your trust. Then you come up to this figure, which is even smaller. Eleven. What could that be? Thousand suppliers. Eleven. This is the amount of years that a supplier is together with IKEA, at least. So, eleven years. The way that we do design is built upon long-term relationships. It's the only way if you want to change stuff. It's not just about buying stuff, easy wins. It's actually building up a long-term trust, partnerships. That's the only way forward. Twenty. What's that all about, huh? That's the amount of designers I have on my team doing four billion stuff. It's not very much, is it? We believe in keeping it small, actually, to have a brain trust within the company. So it's just 20 designers. Of course, we have some designers, like the guys that, and girls that you were talking about, that we take in on contract also. But this is the core of the core. 20 designers working in Elmult, Shanghai, and India. Most of them in Elmult. 15.
That's the amount of years that an average designer has been working for IKEA, of the employed ones. And it's actually the same thing for the hundred that we have on contract. Again, if you want to change stuff, it's about partnerships. It's not just buying people, buying things. Easy ways out. It's long term. And we're so fortunate within IKEA to be able to be long term, because we're not part of the stock market. We're owned by a Stiftung, which in terms is run by a family since years and years, that gives us the opportunity to take on those crazy endeavors into things that nobody on the stock market will dare to do. Long-term thinking. 2000, back to big figures again. That's good. Like big. 2000, what is that all about? We have a range of 10,000 things within IKEA. That's an average range that you meet in our stores on our, or on, on our website. But we do 2,000 new items every year. 2,000. Why do I tell you that? It's because still a lot of people think that IKEA, as any other low-priced company or someone who's selling things cheap, are going to China or other countries and buy from the shelf. We don't buy anything from the shelf. Everything you see at IKEA is designed from scratch by our design team, done together with our partners, who's been with us for 11 years or more. So 2,000 news every year. 180,000. Could you imagine what this is? That's the amount of employees within IKEA right now. They are the ones who makes it, makes it possible to do all of those 2,000 things. Because it's not just about designers, it's actually about teams and how we work together within our company that changes stuff. So all of us, 180,000 employees, working for the same thing. <coughs> so now, listening to that, are you a little bit curious about democratic design? Huh? Take you on a journey, show you some stuff? Yeah. M maybe soon, I don't know. How we look upon design, and this is very important to me, and this is also where we start off. Actually, one of the first things we said when I started off as a design manager five years ago, uh, there is a notion still that design is all about making things. But for us, it's so important that it's about making things better. Both the things as such, but also actually changing behaviors of people around the world by how we design and how we produce and how we make things. Better. How do we see that? I guess you could all have a look around here in this lovely building. You could find things that could be better everywhere. And that's how we do it also. You know, in those small things, you find things that could be better and turn those problems into business opportunities. That's how we think. But it starts with problems. It starts with something that needs to be better. And why do we think that way? I guess most of you know that we do great business around the world. We're fortunate enough to do that. How is it possible? It's because that we don't focus on business within IKEA. We focus on our vision. We're a vision-led company. And our vision makes good business for us. But every time when we fall into the trap on focusing on business, revenues, and all of that that every other big company does, sales go down. We've learned that from the history so many times. But if we focus on our vision and to fulfill our vision, that vision and the way that we do that creates good business. Because it's about making things better for the many people. It's quite simple. It makes us reach out to more people. It makes us do better things just by fulfilling our vision instead of concentrating on business. So democratic design, then, is how we make things better. And uh, <clears throat> it started out <coughs> as something that we thought, this is a great tool for making, making our design process better, and everybody should have the same thing when doing, you know, when reviewing an item and so on. But lately, I've, I've been thinking of democratic design as actually, or this tool, or whatever, the best thing about it is actually that it's a common language. 
And I've been working with design now or design related things for like 30 years almost. And I see that one of the biggest problems or the challenge we have within our community is actually the language challenge. We talk about the same thing, but come from different places. So having something like democratic design and the five principles and letting everybody within the company understand it, understand the five things, understand why it's important and how we measure it and everything, that means that we have the same language, no matter if you're a designer, if you're someone working with interior design in a store, if you're a sales personnel, if you work in the supply chain, everybody is using the same tool. And that is good, because then we understand each other. We're on equal terms. That makes ha things happen faster and better. So, I'll take you through it. It consists of uh, five dimensions or pillars, how we work with design at IKEA. I brought this one. Some of you might have heard this story before, but I still think <coughs> it's good. This is a 365 plus, plus water carafe. Why is it called 365 plus? Because it's part of our basic range for cooking and eating, something that you should be able to live with for a long time within your home. The form of it, which is the first pillar, is very much driven by function and functionality. The choices we made in functionality made the form of this piece. Scandinavian approach, you could argue, yeah? It is, because we looked through almost all of the water vessels or water carafes out there and saw that most of them had really thin necks, for instance, because that's a typical way of doing a water carafe from the past, because I guess they used to be for wine once and then you poured water in them or something like that. Then we looked upon what we wanted to achieve with this. We wanted it to make, make an item that would work for everyday life. Then it needed to be able to wash it in a dishwasher. That means that we wanted a wider neck, still having this lovely sound while pouring water through it. So we did a wider neck. I created this. By function, made the form. The same thing goes for the sizing of this. We saw that most people wanted it to be in, uh, you know, you want to have cold water everywhere in the world, except for China. They want to have 37 degrees. So it should be suited for putting ice cubes in. Good with the neck, isn't it? It should also be suited to be in the door of the fridge, because that's where you want to store your water, your tap water. Then we went through all of the different fridges around the world, the sizing of the doors. What would be the perfect diameter of this? What would be the perfect height to fit in, both to the dishwasher, <coughs> upside down, and to the doors? That's the amount of thinking to this one. So that made the functional approach too, of course, which is the second pillar. Then quality. We wanted it to be long-lasting. So that's the choice of material. We could, of course, made this in plastic. But then you know you get scratches. We're a little bit iffy about plastics for the future when it comes into contact with, with uh, things you put into your mouth. Might not be good. We don't really know. We didn't want to take the risk with something would be, would, that would be a basic for the range for the future. So we went for glass and we went for cork. Obvious choice for a stopper. Both of those materials, long lasting and also <coughs> aging in a beautiful way, and 100% recyclable, which is good. Cork used to be an extremely expensive material, but we found out that the cork industry was actually changing, since everybody was using plastics into cheaper wines for, you know, the stopper of the wine. So they had too much cork within the industry, so could we use that into something else? That's why we're putting in cork into a lot of things within IKEA <coughs> right now. It's become a cheaper material with really good properties and it's natural and it's sustainable. So that's the choice. The quality choice happened to be the sustainable choice also. But how we look upon sustainability within IKEA and looking upon it from a democratic design perspective is not just about how we produce stuff or the choices of materials. We want actually to change behaviors of people. So we wanted in this time to change behaviors from buying bottled water to going for tap water, to making something beautiful there. And this is the 
aim we have for the future for making sustainable design. It's actually about changing behaviors of people, not just being sustainable as a company of our own. That's the next frontier for us. Then, it's good to do beautiful item. That works. But it doesn't make sense if people can't, you know, afford it. So working through our chain together with our suppliers with the long-term relationships, we could do a thing like that for three and a half euros. That means that almost all over the world, everybody could afford some good design. And this is the fifth pillar for us, and maybe the most important. This is also the pillar where we start our product development. We always start with the price tag first. We know that's the major threshold for everybody to buy great design. So where do we have the sweet spot for people to be able to reach that kind of design? That's where we start. To reach as many as possible with a better everyday life. So, form, function, quality, sustainability, low price. You can't compromise on any. All five has to be there in all of our products. And it's a constant improvement also. So what's good today, we don't perceive as good in five years' time. You have to improve all the time, making it better. And easy doesn't do it. So, the only way to learn, you know, we've been around now for 70 years. I've been around too many years. And uh, the only way to learn, and our way to learn, is to do a lot and to do a lot of mistakes and learn from our mistakes really fast. So I, I would like to share one of our biggest mistakes. And uh, fortunately enough, I was part of making that mistake too. Uh, <clears throat> this is like <coughs> one of those eureka moments you could get working with design. We thought we had a truly great idea. And that was making inflatable furniture pieces. What could be better? What could be more flat-packed? What could be better business-wise than getting paid for nothing? So we had this notion about making IKEA Air a big, big thing in the 90s. In the mid-90s, this was. And uh, why I share this now is because if you look upon this idea that we had and pull that through democratic design, <laughs> the tool that we have today, it would never have happened. So that's kind of great that we have this tool today. And uh, it was made out of uh, actually sustainable plastic containers put together, formed a sofa, you know, great for cleaning. So many good ads we did on this one too. But if you go through just fast now, the, uh, the principles of democratic design and um, where we ended up. Now, the, uh, the first thing, form, yeah. It was quite good, we were content. But it didn't look, you know, if you want to do something, which is a sofa, and you do it in a, in a completely new material and with completely new ways, maybe it should resemble a sofa also, not look like a spaceship, if you want to reach out with the design. Secondly, function-wise, had quite great comfort, actually. But uh, those compartments, when you sat in it, we're starting off squeaking towards each other. So nobody apparently tested it before putting it on the market. <laughs> Secondly, function-wise, also, it's great with this thing that you can you know, just flip it over and you know, vacuum clean beneath. But it's not so great that the sofa itself is moving around all, all of your home <laughs> because it's too light. <coughs> Things that could have been better. Sustainability-wise, it was really, really good, actually. And, uh, and uh, even quality-wise, we choose super materials. One thing on quality that we didn't you know, think of, because you were supposed to fill those, that was a, everybody has a hairdryer, you know, we thought everybody has a hairdryer at home. So we make the compartments, you fill them with a hairdryer. The only thing is that this plastic was a little bit fragile. Uh, so we said, of course, since we knew that, we said that on, on all of the packaging, that buy these fragile things. No, we didn't say that. But uh, if you fill it up with uh, your hairdryer, be sure to use cold air. <laughs> How many of you guys and girls are using your hairdryer with cold on? <laughs> One, and that's great. I've never done it. So we had huge problems quality-wise because everybody was melting our plastics, so it was impossible to get it airtight afterwards. And then 
pricing was totally wrong. So that's a mistake, but we learn from it. And from out of all of those mistakes, we make, made this idea of democratic design. And as I told you right now, there is no secret to this source. If you want to do great stuff, it's just about hard work. And the products that we do within IKEA, simple thing like this, took us three years. Three years is an average time to product develop if you want to do it great at IKEA. It could take longer if you do a kitchen. It could be a little bit shorter if you work in textiles. So, the way that we do it, we work really close to production. We are always on the production floor when we do the design. We do a lot of the ideas actually together with the producers on site. This is uh, with Pita and Eik and some of our uh, own designers working in Indonesia on a rattan range. We work in a way that we <coughs> always have too many ideas. I know that a lot of you guys work in that way. We call it the fun funnel. You know, if you want to have one great idea, you have to start with too many. So be open-minded when you start off. <laughs> this is a great product, actually. It was part of a, a series called Lacho. It's an extra brain that you put on top of your head. <laughs> <coughs> Sold quite good. Apparently, a lot of people needed it. You know, this is not the way that we work. It's not one by one, sitting in rooms. It's this. This is our team working with product development. I told you before that we had 70, or we have 20 uh, designers, but we actually have 70 teams, product development teams. And there are engineers and specialists for just about everything within IKEA. So the team for doing stuff is far bigger than just the designers, and that's important. So we're curious about people also, not just production. To be able to do this, we need to be close. We don't talk about reaching people, we're actually talking about siding with people. Being there, more like anthropologists than studying through you know, research companies and stuff. So we go home to people, we live with people, we visit them, I visit them, myself, everybody, 180,000 people working for IKEA are visiting people at their homes to get to know the real problems and the ways that they are living. It's quite simple. It's being close to people's problems. That's the only idea we have. Right now, we're actually sharing it too. It could be good for you to know. But we put this together. Some of our findings, we have done three of them now, about life at home in, in um, uh, like bedtime stories, what's happening in the bedroom, what's happening, happening around cooking and eating, and uh, lately, the last one is actually what makes a home. We wanted to know around the world what people thought was making their home. What are the most crucial parts? <coughs> you know what? We found out something that we didn't really know. And uh, because we're a very functionalistic company, so we thought it was all about functions. It was all about emotions. It was emotional needs that they wanted to fulfill, not functional needs when they thought of their homes. And that was the thing all around the world. No matter the size of wallet, it's the same thing. But visit this place, it's quite good actually. Lifeathome.ikea.com Sharing, totally transparent, everything that we know. So, now I'm already almost out of time, so I have to speed up as I see. I have so much more to tell you. <clears throat> I was planning to share a couple of things that we have done actually lately. Uh, using democratic design and thus also making the world a little bit of a better place, sustainability-wise. It's a people and planet positive thinking that we have. So four projects, I'll do them super speedy. Are you ready? Yeah? First, trash culture. Ta-da! How to make furniture out of waste. Those are the lovely ladies of the team who made this happen. And this is actually all about uh, waste mining. So how could we make real furniture from out of a circular loop? And we've made our first pieces right now, which is uh, a kitchen front. So each of those kitchen fronts that we make in the series called Kungsbacka, you have one kitchen front is 25 PET bottles. Inside, it's recycled um, fibers also, so nothing which is virgin. So we do that from out of waste, from, out of, uh, from our own industries was waste when you do logging that we put into this in shipboards. And you know what? 
it doesn't affect the price. That's the good part. So we could do this. Maybe this is the way to get the prices for the future. That's what we see. Working circular, working with this closed loop, is the only way to have resource efficiency for the future. And thus, the only way to get low prices for customers. Because there's going to be scarcity for resources. So we need to do this. It's not just something that we want to do. <coughs> Beautiful mistakes. This is a great colleague of yours here in Amsterdam, Piet Eik. Yeah, not in Amsterdam, and I was thinking of Amsterdam like Netherlands, but it's not. <laughs> not if you ask the people in Eindhoven, anyway. <coughs> so he's, of course, from Eindhoven. Lovely guy. What we've done here is actually look upon another way of being more sustainable, and that is changing people's buying behaviors. The thing that we do within IKEA is, of course, mass production. People love our prices. We get our prices mainly for being smart in how we produce stuff in mass-produced ways. But the thing that is, you know, that's a little bit in contrast to what people right, right now say they want. They want things which are personalized. They want things that are just for them. Something which is a little bit more unique. So the task for this collection, which is actually coming up later on, is to make mass-produced uniqueness. So how could we tweak mass production into every single item being unique? So we have done hand-drawn hand uh, textiles, but made them into algorithms. So everything coming out from this machinery is constantly new patterns. So every piece you buy is new. The same thing with uh, the uh, uh, ceramics. Instead of using like perfect CNC molds, we actually used half crappy craftsmen <coughs> to do the molds, and a lot of them also, so every mold is unique. You have those revolver molds. So everything coming out there is unique, instead of being, you know, perfect. What's the reasoning for that? What's sustainable about that? We have actually learned that if you're... This goes down to, you know, how you buy stuff in the shopping floor. If you buy something from a pallet with a lot of things, which is ex exactly the same, then you just take one. You know, you don't create a relation with the object. But as soon as you have to make a choice, do I love this piece, this vase, a little bit more than the other one besides it? Then you create a relation with the object. And that's great design also. So that's what it's all about. Because if you have a relation with your object, you're more likely to, to uh, love it a little bit more and to keep it a little bit longer. So a more sustainable behavior around shopping. That's why mass-produced uniqueness is good. So this is coming up in April 2018. It's a lovely range, actually, called Industriell, which is like mass production in Swedish. Then, I think I'll, yeah, I'll do this too. That's good. We have the wedge dowel. What is that? Oh, I don't know. You know, IKEA, we have been famous for uh, how we put our things together. You know, we had the Allen key in the 70s. Everything was put together with the Allen key, and that was part of our, our uh, identity, actually, how you put things together. Take some time from time to time to put together something from out of IKEA. I could acknowledge that. So we thought maybe to spend some time to solve that problem for the future. And also to have a more sustainable thinking. Because if you put things together that way, they're really hard to pull apart again. And we see that the behavior of people right now is that they move more and more. That means that they have to move the things they have more and more. That means that they want to buy it flat pack, but they also want to make it flat pack again. So could we change that through design? And then we actually did this innovation. And this is not the designers doing it. It's the guys at our uh, prototype shop solving it. Truly great craftsmen. And it's state-of-the-art engineering also, because this is ultrasonic welding. Nothing un or something which is unheard of when you talk about how you do furniture. That's like old school, how we produce furniture. Is it down like that? <coughs> Put it together. Yeah. yeah, if you do it in the right way, it's even better. <laughs> That's a great presentation, isn't it? <laughs> Because I put it the other way around. <laughs> so 
it should be like this. 45 degrees. And you just do the same thing if you want to put it apart again. Smarter than me, you have to be, although. So this is an old technique done in a super industrialized new way. That means that we could do smarter furniture for the future that is easier to assemble. Of course, that's more sustainable too, that you could flat pack it again. Last but not least, the one euro challenge. You know, from time to time there are these leaps in technology that comes. What's sad about those leaps is when they come, they're very often extremely expensive. Have you thought about that? Oh, here's the great thing that everybody wants. Then it's, you know, nobody can reach it. And that was what happened with LED. Great technology. Really great when it came. But at unreachable prices. Nobody wanted to buy it. Nobody wanted to buy that bulb, although they knew that it would last for like 35 years, because it was so expensive to buy. And this was one of the things that actually our founder, Ingvar, found out. And he gave a challenge to the girl who worked in the product development department for, for this. You know, this technology is so good, we have to make it reach a lot of people. So he did the one euro challenge. And this was an ongoing project for a lot of years, I could tell you. So how could you make something which at that time costed about 30 euros for one euro? How do you do it? We tore it apart into you know, particles and everything and tried to be smart, took every, every way, you know, like, oh, could we do it with less material? Could we make it smaller? All of the tricks that you used before in the book. What actually saved us was not making it by choices of cheaper things. It was actually making a choice of a little bit more expensive things, but less. So we choose some of the internal electronics here, more expensive, but less of them. That made us reach that price. So now we could actually do a light bulb from LED for uh, one euro. That's a pretty good thing. And uh, it's good for environment too, because it's 85% 85, 85 less energy used. So if you have like a 7 million people city using LED bulbs instead of the old bulbs, it will be like the usage of a 1 million uh, inhabitant city nowadays. 85% less. That's good for people. Good for us, good business for IKEA. So, most things still remains to be done. And uh, I would like just to uh, finish off shortly with uh, summing up the, uh, the uh, thing that we did this morning. Because I think, you know, that there's so many things that I would like to take on and we would like to take on as a company. And we did this small workshop. Some of you were part of it, and I think it was great. And uh, it's all about using the collective brain of people. You know, being curiosity-led, reaching out to more people. That's where we are as a company right now. <coughs> and what we're curious upon right now, in terms of things that could change the world also, is actually off the grid. What is that? Of course, it's about all of those people who don't want to be on the grid in the Western world. You know, I don't want to be part of this anymore. I don't want to, be, want to be part of the internet. I want to have my own communication system. I don't want to be part of the energy system. I want to create my own energy. I just want to have some courts which, which is in order. But it's also this fact. Two billion people around the world actually don't have access to grids. That's a problematic thing. So could we take on both of those problems or possibilities at the same time, doing something new about it? And that was the thing, the challenge that we started off this morning, together with people, having 30 minutes taking on this. And uh, the way that we do it within IKEA is not about sketching and you know, talking a, a lot. Like I've been talking too much now, I, I can see that on the clock. Because talk is cheap. Work is hard. We love to work. We love to do stuff. Try and do and change from what we've done, instead of just strategizing about it. We have learned that that is faster and it's more accurate where you're working when you design. So, maybe if we could still 
three minutes more of your time. Is that okay with you, guys? Huh? Are you still interested? Then I would like to invite uh, Mr. Mikkel Axelsson on stage, which is one of my uh, designers on my team. So, please. Thanks. So, I was actually hired by Marcus uh, like five years ago uh, because he saw these uh, lamps uh, on an exhibition. And what's nice about those ones is that they are all off the grid. So, let me explain them from uh, start with the one on the left. That one you just pull up and pull up the weight to the roof and then you let it fall down slowly and there's a cord that goes into the lamp where there's a generator and it creates light. And then you have the one in the middle and then that one you can just hang up anywhere you want and then you just pull it a couple of times and it lights up. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did those back in 2010, so they're like... Yeah, maybe the choice of material wasn't yeah. that good. No, maybe not, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> and the... And the <laughs> 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 Thanks. <laughs> and the right one, the balloon lamp, you blow up the balloon, and then the air goes through a generator, and it uh, creates uh, light. And the nice thing with those ones is that you can put them up anywhere. You don't have to... Uh, think about where you have your power outlet or so. Uh, but one interesting thing is that it doesn't, that didn't start out as an off-the-grid project. It was more to research about how we can give uh, more value to, to products, how we can, uh, like em emotional value. So I started looking into poetic machines and uh, artists like uh, Alexander Kaller and uh, Tinge Lee. <coughs> uh, uh, and they did machines because they, they thought that the regular machines in the industry <coughs> were only bringing death and they, that they were ugly. So they wanted to make nice machines that uh, the, when you look at them, you get really mesmerized. So we used to, to show everything within the lamps, the generator, and showing <coughs> what, what is going on. You can see all the gearing and you get really uh, mesmerized by, by it. And this, yeah, so for the workshop, we wanted to, you guys to, there was in the workshop to, to work with this more mechanical way and also not to use like <coughs> batteries. Because that's also one thing with, the, with this lamp, with the weight, that you, it, it doesn't need any, any batteries. Something fun about when you, uh, when you can work by yourself also, you know, mm -hmm. instead of just <coughs> talking to each other, start off working. A lot yeah. of things happen. It was just 30 minutes. And uh, yeah, you can see by yourself, sticks, stones, paper, all of the crap needed. Came up with some great ideas that I wanted to share, lastly. <laughs> <coughs> Let's see if we put them into production. <laughs> An electrical toothbrush, which is non-electrical without battery. Just turn it up. I think it's, you know, pretty simple, but a good idea. It's rechargeable, still. It's good for kids as well. Like you can turn it up for like one minute and they, then it stops after one minute. <laughs> and using everyday movements also, things that you do a lot in your home that creates energy, but harvest that energy. One of the things we see in sales in kitchens is actually that people want to have uh, light inside of their kitchens. So instead of adding electricity to it, make the drawer do the electricity. It's easier actually, so hands on. Good idea. Then <laughs> this, the poo mm, machine. Super nice. <laughs> <laughs> the biobat, yeah. which is actually a, a composting thing uh, that you could have, uh, which creates some warmth that creates energy inside that you could lead out like hot water from out of, you know, harvesting your poo. <laughs> Good idea too. So uh, that's what I want to say. We can't make it on our own. Uh, we actually constantly have to reach out and work with more people. And that is important to us. And well, I was planning to meet those guys also, but we skipped them, I think. <laughs> uh, <coughs> because we're already too late. So if you're interested in looking upon what we do, in a couple of weeks, actually, we're going to share a lot of news in Elmelt. And uh, that is on something we call Democratic Design Days, when we invite people from all over the world coming to us. But it's also going to be live on IKEA.today, so go in there. And IKEA.today is also where we are sharing everything we do, from our travels, from how we produce, where we produce, how we think, sketches from the very start of all of our design projects. So it's a totally transparent way of working with design from now on. 
So uh, I think that's it, or more than it, actually. It's Ladies time. and gentlemen, Marcus Engman. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. Thank you, Marcus. Let's say a true modernist company. I'm so amazed about how you opened up, let's say, this notion of um, democratic design. Earlier today, BC Williams of Massive uh, Change Network actually sort of hinted on uh, the Madonna curve. The Madonna curve is that you always have to be ahead already. So I was wondering, you've hinted on some aspects of opening <coughs> up uh, truly making the design process uh, open source, if you like, or at least that would be my, my question. What, what could be the next step in terms of um, communicating with all the people out there, bringing new ideas in? Obviously, you're very clearly being very transparent about how you do that. But I was wondering, one of the things that we've been hinting on is like circular economies through the lens of not user-driven, but uh, sorry, not owner-driven, but user-driven. Is this something that you have been working on at the moment? The circular approach, actually, is something that we're... It's one of the things that we dig into most right now. Yeah. It's a lot of hours spent on, on how to do that, because it's all, also the only way forward. If we need to, you know, keep on growing to reach more people out in the world, not just selling more to the ones who, already, who we're already selling to, which is not solving our vision, then we need to be far more resource efficient. So circularity is one of the big questions, absolutely. Yeah. But then I think... Oh, sorry. Yes, that means the Design Council... Cool. The Climate Council has a... Who, this is who a little bit like the word? A, All three? Yeah. It's like the Muppet Show. You have those... Inge, Inge. <laughs> the grumpy guys up there. Yeah. Huh? Who, who give a... Can I give the mic? I was wondering... Go for um, it. For this uh, energy transition, we really need the masses to uh, get along with us. And do you expect that with your uh, democratic design, you can play a role in that? Absolutely. You know, what, uh, we talked about us doing four billion things, but we're also reaching out to, uh, to more than two billion people every year. It's 800 million people coming <coughs> to our stores. It's, I think, 1.4 billion people visiting our website. So it's a big responsibility, but it's also a big opportunity if you want to change things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody else? Otherwise, yes. I have one more question. Yeah. Oh, go for it, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, Marcelo. just to, just to know what, if you can share with us uh, what impact or which impact are you expecting from third dimension printing, designing and printing, and, and your concept of democrat democratic design. <coughs> The future 3D, 3D of 3D printing, yes. Uh, the 3D, it's, it's fun. When everybody's talking about the future, everybody's always talking about 3D printing as the future. I'm not so sure. Uh, there are so many things still to be developed within 3D printing. The filaments, for instance, is not good for nature at all. So uh, that's one thing. And it's too slow, and it's really small scale. So if you want to use it, you should use it in a way that means that we could mass produce, but mass produce uniqueness by 3D printing. That's smart. The smart thing with 3D printing is that you ca could come closer so you get rid of uh, logistical costs. That's good for everybody, and that's good for the environment, too. So that's the good part of 3D printing, but still, there are some years before it's going to be super big. Yeah. I'm going to... You're having the last question of today. Go for it. OK, you know, in, in Copenhagen, we have our, our offices that we share the same ground with Copenhagen Fashion Institute. And then we hear a lot of times, like, for example, GAP, made a huge uh, progress that instead of using, I don't know, 800 millions of liters to make jeans, now they use 750 millions. But they still release a new collection every three months. You are saying that you have 4 billion products already in the market. So my, my question is, do we really need those 4 million? Do we really need another white teacup? <clears throat> when IKEA, for example, can have the IKEA refugee shelter, which is amazing. So why, why keep on focusing on these mass productions of different variations of the same thing when you can make an IKEA shelter refugee? Uh, why do you have to make a choice between the two? I think, first of all, doing mass production or, or doing things in the scale that we do, it's, it's, you have to consider why we do it. If it's all about reaching the same people and try to sell more to the same people, 
that would be no argue about it. It would only be uh, our overconsumption. That's not good for anyone. But if you remember what we said in our vision, it's about reaching more people to make a better everyday life for more people. So what we are striving for all the time is to find new customers and new people who has the need for our things, not selling more to the same people. That's not overconsumption. That's actually solving people's needs and problems. So for me, then, using mass production for solving that kind of problems is a good thing. That's how I think on it. And then, if we could get the means from out of that to also solve things like for refugees and refugee camps, mm. that must be good for everybody. We have to keep it at that. Any other questions for Marcus Engman at the bar, please? Give it up <laughs> one more time for Mr. Marcus Engman. Hey, yeah. And as Saskia...